Hi, folks. Brad Gore here from Dick Arboretum of the Plains, and I'm looking forward to tackling this topic with you uh, that I've called Liberating the Prairie of Trees and Shrubs. Now, this is maybe a bit of a misleading title in a sense that it feels like you can just do something once and then the prairie is liberated. But this is an ongoing process and I'll explain more um, why that is. Basically, I wanna do about four things here in this session with you. I want to introduce the Dick Arboretum and the education that we try to instill to help uh, teach people about the prairie. Oh, I'll just give just a, a little bit of, of my background and, and the experience, the perspective that I bring to this topic here at the Arboretum. I want to identify the, the problem and it's, and it's big and diverse, but we'll just touch on that and then try to give you a synopsis of the, the management tools that are available to us uh, in this effort to liberate the prairie of trees and shrubs. So let us begin. The Carbreedum of the Plains is located in Heston, Kansas, and we have uh, been here for 42 years. And that uh, part of our existence here has been to help teach people about, uh, about the prairie and its existence on the landscape and to um, highlight the, the cultural and, and natural history of that prairie and why it benefits us as Kansans in this place. Harold and Evie, when they started Dick Arboretum of the Plains, were uh, inspired by the Bartlett Arboretum in Belle Plaine, and they wanted to bring a, bring, a, bring a piece of what they saw south of Wichita there to uh, this location in their hometown. Uh, they're philanthropists, and they wanted to um, have a place where people could provide inspiration and recreation in ways that connected them to the Kansas landscape and the prairie being a big part of that. And uh, their mission has, has evolved over time, but in recent times, we feel that it is most, it is best encapsulated by, the mission name is cultivating transformative relationships between people and the land. And I hope that you, you gather that as we go through uh, this, this connection and as we talk about being stewards of the prairie. My perspective in bringing coming to this um, has always been influenced by Prairie, both in my undergraduate education at Bethel College in North Newton, where I was able to get immersed in 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 a prairie reconstruction at that location. Uh, in addition to learning about remnant prairies that exist out there in the landscape, uh, but then really diving into this topic in in grad school and at the University of Wisconsin, where kind of leaned into the nuts and bolts of of how to reconstruct a prairie, how to restore existing degraded prairies, and then how to maintain and manage those prairies over time. And you know this can happen with native ecosystems in general, but uh, the prairie has been central to that uh, that inspiration for me. Uh, over the years, staying in the in the Great Plains and Midwestern areas where prairies have been uh, dominant. Now, as far as this landscape uh, here at the Dick Arboretum, we have uh, about 30 acres, and you can see on the, the northern part of this uh, here with uh, the kind of the green section, it's the oldest part, the 42-year-old part of the Arboretum, and uh, that part has been featuring uh, more of the horticultural or, or gardening aspect of, of teaching people about uh, the native plants of the prairie and how they can utilize them uh, in, in garden settings, in, in urban environments around the places that we live mostly. And you'll see many examples of that uh, throughout that, uh, that kind of northern 13 acres at the Arboretum as we have planted and, and tended and tried to interpret uh, these little prairie gardens. Uh, that, that try to match the landscape and, and, and feature plants in, in different ways and assemblages and, and trying to do so in horticulturally aesthetic ways as possible. All while connecting people to the natural history of Kansas, uh, to the, the pollinators, the insects, all the animals that, that those insects that support in that uh, prairie garden ecosystem. And then also touching into the, the cultural elements as well. 
of, of what prairie means to us as Kansans. So many examples of that throughout the, the northern part of that arboretum. The, uh, some of the outlets that we also connect with uh, the, the, our membership and the people in the community include uh, uh, our big uh, event every spring and fall that includes the Flora Kansas uh, native plant sale, native and adaptable plants. And uh, not only do we try to get plants into the hands of people to help them landscape and paint their landscapes uh, with these uh, native and adaptable plants, but uh, we're also trying to uh, provide education uh, about the prairie uh, that existed here and ways that that prairie can benefit uh, us in our urban settings as well. Another uh, big way that I'm in, involved here at the Arboretum uh, is to try to help uh, inspire and involve teachers, uh, K through 12 teachers and their students in, in the amazing educational opportunities that come with landscaping with native plants as well. Earth Partnership for Schools program is one way we do that. And we've been doing that for the last 15 years. Um, uh, the, uh, the next one, our 16th will be on uh, June 5 through 9. Uh, here at the Arboretum in 2023. I should also mention that our plant sale, our next big Flora Kansas event will be April 20 uh, through 24. But both of these are kind of good outreach ways that we can um, access the public and, and try to inspire them to, to utilize native plants and, and all the educational opportunities that come with those. Uh, the, uh, I show this slide again to show the, the southern half of the Arboretum that's also been part of our educational outlet and is one of the reasons that I was brought on here to staff uh, nearly 20 years ago was to take this, uh, this southern, uh, about 17 to 18 acres of what was a former agricultural ground and turn that into a reconstructed prairie and, and to do so in ways that uh, additionally, it like people get inspired to gardening with native plants in the northern part of the Arboretum. We want to kind of help give them a flavor of the, that ecosystem uh, approach and what can be on the landscape and inspire restoration of, of prairie remnants and, and to, to restore those on the landscape, as well as be inspired by that, that plant community that has shaped uh, Kansas in so many ways. We did that uh, around that time, starting in about 2005 by, by collecting seed from remnant prairies uh, throughout the landscape and doing so within about a 60 mile radius of, of Heston, Kansas. The Heston is located here in the northern part of Harvey County, right in that Wellington McPherson lowlands uh, region. That region was dominated by tall grass prairie that uh, didn't have a rocky substrate that kept it from being turned for agriculture. So most of the that physiographic region has been uh, converted to agriculture. And so when knowing that and wanting to restore and reconstruct, reconstruct prairie at the Arboretum, we had to turn to remnant prairies that mostly existed uh, within that 60 mile radius and a lot of those being where the similar prairies would have been in the Flint Hills, Uplands and the Smoky Hills that were protected by rocky substrates that allow for many prairies still to exist in those locations today. So we set out to, to know a lot of those prairies and collect seed from those, put seed mixes together and restore that prairie then uh, at the Arboretum using those seed mixes. And it has turned out pretty successful over the last uh, kind of 15 to 17 years. Uh, we've seen those prairies mature and resemble uh, some of the remnants that we were hoping to, cre to create blueprints of. And they're sort of uh, learning laboratories. We do lots of field trips there. We help, uh, uh, kind of uh, try to inspire uh, visitors uh, with the possibilities for what, how prairie can be can reconstructed like we've done here. And, and why that mission is so important is because the original landscape uh, over much of the last 10,000 years has existed in prairie uh, throughout uh, not only Kansas, but uh, throughout the interior part of, of North America, certainly the, the middle part of the United States. And, um, and you can see that that extends through, throughout that full region and let's focus in on Kansas a little bit more uh, to see the details of what that prairie would have looked like for thousands of years. You see in the, the western part of the state, there would have been short grass prairie, uh, the middle part of the state, mixed grass prairie, 
the, the eastern part of the state, tall grass prairie, and then uh, you start to get into some more oak woodlands uh, intermixed with prairie as you move further east into Missouri into the Ozarks. But prairie was certainly a, a major theme throughout uh, all of that region. Uh, and much of that was due to um, disturbance mechanisms, which I'll say more about. Kansas is very well suited to grow trees, uh, which is part of the topic of this conversation that we're having. And, uh, and you can see that in the rainfall map of Kansas. Uh, the rainfall map of Kansas is, is shaped by the Rocky Mountain rain shadow. So off to the west in Colorado, you have the, the rain shadow of the Rockies that affects um, the, the vertical bands of precipitation averages that we have across the state. Western Kansas being, you know, five to 10 inches of rainfall, and then slightly increasing bands as you move away from the rain shadow from west to east, uh, you get more rainfall. And so uh, 20 to 20, 25 inches in the central part of the state, and then even more like 40 to 45 inches of rainfall in the eastern part of the state. And so uh, very much affected by the rain shadow, but also, uh, it also has an impact on the types of vegetation we have in Kansas as well. Um, I'll say, well, let's go back to that. And that is correlated with that increasing rainfall from west to east of, of increasingly higher and, and more dense uh, grasslands as you move across the state. And uh, the, uh, the reason that we have those grasslands uh, is in this Great Plains Prairie is due to these, uh, uh, these two bottom pictures that are disturbance mechanisms that have been natural parts of the landscape for thousands of years. Uh, the, the herds of the bison that would have uh, roamed the plains and, and been in big massive herds all concentrated together that will roam through an area and eat all of the vegetation just down to a nubbins uh, before moving on and doing the same in other locations. And, uh, and then the, the, the fires that would have occurred naturally as well. There would have been many lightning set fires that would have uh, been pushed and, and roared across the plains uh, for hundreds of miles uh, due to you know, undis, undivided grasslands. Um, and then also indigenous people take, had a big role in uh, using lots of fires in their, their hunting methods, uh, clearing areas to, for safety, uh, their cultural methods, lots of, lots of fire in their rituals. And so fire was used even more, more, fire was present more extensively on the landscape due to indigenous people as well. Uh, but all that to say that these two dis disturbance mechanisms uh, really had helped create this sustainable sort of symbiosis uh, on the landscape uh, between um, prairie and, and these disturbance mechanisms uh, that, that were in place. And uh, it wasn't until like the 1800s when European settlers came on uh, to the landscape and pretty much you know, ethnically cleansed the landscape of indigenous people. And along with that, uh, we're getting rid of the, the bison and getting rid of uh, you know, fire as the, as agriculture sort of broke up the landscape and kept fires from spreading as, as ubiquitously. Um, and so a combination of all those factors pretty quickly broke this relationship between people in the landscape and, and a native prairie ecosystem that existed on the landscape. And very quickly, well, we started to see the demise of the prairie and the invasion of, of trees and shrubs that would have been held at bay for all these, all these years uh, out further east. And, uh, and we also saw that in, in our studies here at the Arboretum. When I first started the Arboretum and lots of these uh, seed collecting forays that we used to restore that prairie at the Arboretum, we were able to connect with a lot of uh, remnant prairies in those Smoky Hills areas and uh, those Flint Hills areas uh, within that 60 mile radius and learned a lot about these prairies. You know, we, not only were we collecting seed, uh, but we were seeing the makeup of them and the birds and butterflies that they supported and, and saw this important connection between a diversity of prairie, the diversity of plant species being correlated to a higher diversity of uh, birds and butterflies and, and other fauna uh, that you would find in that landscape. And, 
you can see that uh, that was kind of through all these physiographic regions, but especially in that Smoky Hills and Flint Hills areas. And so uh, some of the, the prairies were of large enough expanse and, and well-maintained enough to where they didn't have any trees and shrubs on them yet uh, about you know, 17, 18 years ago. Uh, but most of the prairies we visited had some infusion of trees already, and uh, many of those landscapes look more like this, uh, or like this, or like even this. And, uh, and so we were seeing that already uh, a couple of decades ago, and uh, the problem has only been exacerbated since. Early on, uh, one of the first symposia that, that I pulled together in that first year at the Arboretum uh, was to help kind of assess the, the health of the prairie and the landscape here. In addition to what we were seeing out there, we wanted to hear from prairie experts and we brought them in. And one of those was Randy Rogers with the Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks. And Randy had just written an article about tree invasion and uh, what he was seeing out on the landscape of this quickly changing of the, of the dynamics and, and the visual and the, the ecology of these prairies due to tree invasion. And he's sounding an alarm in this great article. If you if you Google Randy Rogers' name, Rogers with a D uh, in there, and, and tree invasion, you'll find a PDF of this great article. And uh, anyway, lots of inspiration in there, sounding the alarm about uh, what was happening very quickly in this loss of prairies. These are some of the photos uh, that I pulled from his article. Uh, but you saw many prairies at the time being very open, was just a, you know, kind of a little tiny incursion of some small uh, seedlings of trees. Uh, but it doesn't take long when those don't receive fire or, or you know, intensive enough grazing from like bison the way they would graze, uh, that you would see uh, trees become more and more of a dotting presence on the landscape and trees keep growing up. And pretty soon uh, the whole visual aesthetic and the ecology of these prairies uh, changed uh, not only within a matter of decades, but even within a matter of years. You can see a, a big change happen in just 10 to 15 years, especially when you get years of good rainfall. Much of that conversion have, uh, has had to do with, with this species right here, the, the Eastern Red Cedar. Uh, and this juniper has been very prolific at, um, at being um, uh, dispersed throughout the landscape. The birds love the seeds, they spread them. Um, it is also very susceptible to fire, very flammable and, and, and cutting it, once you cut it, it won't re-sprout. But uh, they are very prolific in spreading and that's one of the major species that we've seen uh, invade the prairies uh, uh, throughout Kansas. I'm just going to highlight an article here sent to me by a friend uh, from Wired, um, I believe it's an online resource and podcast as well uh, that that highlights you know this problem also from an economic perspective you know Kansas not only has this natural and cultural history that is shaped by the prairie uh, but we have this this economy you know both of our cultivated agriculture which has been due thanks to the legacy of these deep-rooted prairies that created the best soils in the world uh, but also, you know, an existing grazing culture as well that makes us one of the top three producers in, in beef cattle uh, in the United States. That, uh, you know, Kansas is a very important part of our agricultural economy. And so the loss of grassland species and, and prairie uh, ecosystems uh, can have an economic impact as well for on us. And I'm this, uh, this article is just important enough in this synopsis that I'm going to just read sections of it. So... Uh, Fast-growing, drought-tolerant trees are slowly spreading across grasslands on every continent. Given how desperate we are to reduce carbon in the atmosphere, millions of new saplings sprouting each year might seem like a good thing. But in reality, their spread across vulnerable grasslands and shrublands is upending ecosystems and livelihoods. As these trees transform into woodland, wildlife disappears, water supplies dwindle, and soil health suffers the risk of catastrophic wildfire also skyrockets. In a study uh, published in the Journal of Applied Ecology, researchers have shown how woodland expansion also takes an economic toll. American ranchers often depend on free range rangelands, to, uh, tree free rangelands to raise their livestock. And between 1990 and 2019, a short 30 years, landowners in the Western US lost out on nearly 5 billion worth of forage. The plants, the cat, the cattle and sheep eat because of the growth of new trees. Uh, Reinhard Schultz 
a University of Nebraska Lincoln biologist uh, was quoted as saying grasslands are the most imperiled and least protected terrestrial ecosystem. Uh, also called the plains, our planet's grasslands have dwindled drastically. Less than 10% are still intact as most have been plowed under for crops or bulldozed for human development. One of the most dire threats facing the grasslands that remain is woody encroachment. It's a slow and silent killer. Uh, they go on to say about how, you know, the massive amounts that are lost, uh, but one of the key elements of this, this last part of the article that I referred to is that the, the tree cover has increased by 50% across the western half of the U.S. in over the past 30 years and that this is a huge threat and it's something that I haven't really been taking seriously as much recently, but when I've seen some of the numbers, I've heard some other presenters, I've seen how fast uh, some of these prairies are, are, are turning over uh, from grasslands uh, to tree covered landscapes. Um, it, it's becoming obvious to me that this is really a dire situation for Kansas and why I wanted to, to cover this topic as part of our native plant school. Uh, you can see with this, uh, this graph on the left uh, that they show that just in, in from 2008 to, to 2016, less than a decade, look at that just almost exponential uh, rise in, in tree cover expansion uh, that is happening. Uh, you can see on the right side there then um, during uh, that 28 year period for, or an 18 year period from 2000 to 2018, uh, from aerial imagery, how how quickly that severity uh, of woodland transition has occurred, uh, turning grasslands into tree-covered landscapes. And I want to zoom in a little bit more on that particular image to see how much of that eastern part of the state, especially where the higher rainfall amounts are happening, of how quickly that is happening without the intensive uh, uh, disturbance mechanisms in place. And it's not that those disturbance mechanisms aren't happening. Uh, they're still happening in the Flint Hills and they may be happening even at higher rates than they once did, say, you know, 40, 50 years ago. But the problem is, is the number of seed sources that have infiltrated that area have just exploded. So the, the amounts of disturbance that are happening in grazing and in fire just aren't able to keep up with the barrage of, of new seedlings and new trees uh, that are coming onto the landscape. And this is something that wouldn't have occurred 100 years ago because those seed sources just weren't in place. And so uh, what you're seeing in these areas, and especially like, uh, you know, one of the, the most valued uh, areas of prairie left in Kansas, this Flint Hills Uplands uh, ecoregion that you see uh, kind of in the, the, the middle eastern part of the state, uh, is really astounding the amount uh, of, of tree invasion that's happening there. This is from a couple of images uh, presented by Tony Capizzo. He's uh, the Flint Hills ecoregion manager for the Ch Kansas chapter of the Nature Conservancy. He was spoke as part of our winter lecture series at the Arboretum here in 2021, showing that in just you know 29 years, how much has been lost. And it's not unlikely uh, to think like uh, that article showed, uh, that 50% of the grasslands have been lost uh, in just the, the small amount of remaining prairie that's out there. So not only do we have a little bit of prairie left, but we're losing that prairie uh, at an astounding rate in, in recent decades. So that highlights the problem. And uh, I wanna get into now the solution. Trying to figure out not only using historic disturbance regimes that have already identified, you know, with fire and, and with grazing, uh, you know, humans now have to be a really integral part of bringing those, those disturbance regimes back to the landscape even more so as we try to fight this higher intensity of trees on the landscape that have not only migrated from east to west in the absence of disturbance, right, re, uh, disturbance regimes, but uh, also as we've had more uh, human inhabitants on the prairie and we've brought with us trees and shrubs that we planted in our landscapes, we've just exponentially increased the number of seed sources that continue to uh, escape and invade uh, out into those prairie areas. So indeed, uh, trying to use 
humans to bring fire back in the form of prescribed burning and trying to uh, do rotational grazing that more simulates what the bison would have done uh, through cattle grazing. I'll say more about each of these two uh, here in a minute. Uh, also, we will um, introduce uh, some other uh, types of disturbance regimes that are kind of new or maybe simulating what burning and grazing uh, can be or, or provide alternatives. And those would include haying, mowing, cutting, uh, spraying with herbicides and, and grinding. Um, and I'll say more about each of those as we move forward as well. But one of the things that I, that I want to kind of highlight here is uh, as I try to show with this triangle is sort of a spectrum running from the historic disturbance regimes all the way into these newer ones. And, and going the spectrum, uh, kind of going from what is probably a lower dollar amount in, in the historic disturbance, disturbance regimes. Um, and as we have to get more intensive with the bigger, uh, bigger trees and more equipment, uh, that that, uh, uh, progression of, of dollars invested to get rid of trees will only go up. And uh, so kind of the take home message of that is that if we can start earlier and use some of these, you know, wider spread methods of historic disturbance regimes, then, then we can probably try to tackle this problem in, in a little uh, more economic way. Uh, but you'll see how more, it's more expensive it gets when we let it get away from us. So let's start with prescribed burning. This is probably of, of all the methods and disturbance regimes, this is the one I've had the most experience with over uh, kind of the last about two and a half uh, decades or almost three uh, of, of helping provide education and helping implement uh, prescribed burning on the landscape. And I can't in the short amount of time uh, teach you how to do uh, a safe and effective uh, prescribed burn, but I will just highlight some of the, the important uh, conditions that need to be in place uh, when we when we do think about implementing a prescribed burn. And I'll say more about some resources to for you to turn to as well. Uh, good fire break is, is the best preparation you can do for any prescribed burn. Uh, getting a, a really uh, low mode, as wide as possible uh, fire break uh, to be able to move around the end of your, your burn unit and, and be able to have water vehicles have access to the site, and then making sure that it is as clean of debris as possible. That is probably the best thing you can do uh, to provide a, a lower stress and safe uh, prescribed burn. When it comes to the day of the prescribed burn, there are two things that you really need to uh, most carefully uh, watch, and those are relative humidity and wind speed. Relative humidity uh, generally is pretty simple, between 20% and 80% is what you're aiming for. 20%, it's almost impossible to put fire out. 80%, it's almost impossible to start fire. So somewhere in like a 30 to 70 range is generally probably the, the desired conditions. And uh, even closer to the middle, to the 50% is, 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 is kind of what would be ideal conditions. But uh, wind speeds, you won't uh, be able to get uh, permission to start a prescribed burn from the powers that be of uh, 911 dispatchers if it's over 15 miles per hour. And it's nice to have a little bit of wind, something like closer to around at least five miles per hour uh, so that you can control fire. Uh, if you have no wind, uh, fires can be shifty and move back and forth. And, and if you have shifting winds, that can be dangerous conditions for controlling fire. So those are some of the general conditions that you look for in doing a burn. I'm just going to review uh, some of the basic uh, protocol that goes into this as well that you will see uh, with any recommendations in starting prescribed burn. First of all, in thinking about with all those conditions that I mentioned with an established fire break, uh, making sure you have the decent relative humidity guidelines in place, and then thinking of knowing where your wind comes from, uh, it's always safest to start with a back burn or the downwind side of the uh, of the, the fire unit as much as possible. So in this uh, picture you're seeing over here on the far right is going to be the most downwind side and you will start by doing your burning kind of going in both directions. Usually it's best to have two people lighting those fires so that you can create a black line and move slowly in both these directions. Um, uh, but that's sort of the general idea. A backfire is one that works against the wind. So you can see that the wind is coming from the right. You start on the left up against the, the fire break and you want to slowly work that fire back 
uh, against the wind because it's the, the safest and most controllable fire uh, that's going to keep it low and manageable. And once you develop that black line that gets wide enough and safe enough, then you can move around to, to the flanks of the, of, the, of the the burn unit. But these are just a, a few images of back burns uh, to show how, how, how safe they are and, and how easy they are to manage. And so it's really critical to not only monitor the wind speed at the moment, but make sure you're looking for hours in the future to make sure that wind direction is not going to change on you because that's when fires get out of hand. But you can see that these back burns uh, do create uh, safe conditions to work with uh, for starting a fire. Then once you've developed that safe black line uh, on the downwind side, you can move around to the flanks uh, where you start to get a little bit more intensive fire because it's starting to blow the, the wind. The wind is starting to blow the fire more into your fuel. And, uh, but even though the, those fires will be a little bit larger, you know that you have, it's not going to go anywhere downwind because you have that safe black line around your perimeter. Here you see a, a flank fire in process uh, as you're moving along that side, uh, perpendicular to the wind. And then once you have those, uh, not only your backfire with your with your large black line around the backside, but also on the flanks, uh, then you can go to uh, finishing what we call this ring fire technique, where you ring uh, the, the property with fire. Uh, it takes about 90% of the time to burn the first 10% of the site, and then uh, about... Uh, um, about 10% of your time is going to be spent burning about 90% of the site with that, uh, that big head fire that you're about to start. So once you've created those safe perimeter conditions, you can quickly go ring the fire uh, around the perimeter, start that head fire that will quickly roar across the rest of your site, but you know it's going to go out because it's going to hit those black lines uh, that you've already created. So basically a ring fire technique that just about um, all managers follow and um, that's kind of the nuts and bolts of, of conducting a prescribed burn. Some of the tools that, that I find most effective uh, have kind of usually been lower technology, not having big water rigs to, to carry water. So uh, the, the best way of, I've learned to manage those fires is, is with this uh, Smith Can uh, fire pump. Uh, it has about a five gallon uh, tank and uh, you can spray that with that hand pump about 10 to 15 feet right where you want it. And uh, it's a really effective tool for carrying water right to the locations where you need it. And then you just need supply, uh, uh, supply water vehicles to bring water to the people using those, uh, those Smith uh, fire pump cans. Another effective tool is, is a fire mop. Uh, again, a low tech, uh, uh, basically uh, mud flap on a stick that you can use to kind of uh, mop back and forth and uh, snuff out uh, the fire with this, uh, with this fire resistant um, uh, material uh, that you can snuff out with pressure similar to the way you would maybe with a shovel or something. Uh, starting the fire exactly where you want it is effective with like this drip torch that uh, you fill with a, a safe mixture of 50% diesel, 50% gas. Uh, it's a less volatile mix with the diesel component. Uh, but I've also found in recent years that uh, just as an effective tool uh, is the even lower tech option of, of a regular garden rake. Uh, getting a head full of, of dry grass and starting that dry grass on fire and dragging it with the teeth down uh, can be a really great way of putting fire right where you want it and, and then wiping the grass out uh, when you want to stop spreading fire. So that's actually become my, my favorite tool um, out there uh, when I'm conducting a prescribed burn. There are some, some great resources in Kansas uh, to turn to. Uh, the Kansas Prescribed Fire Council, uh, that is a site managed by the Kansas Grazing Lands Coalition, uh, is, is a site that you should look up and you can find uh, these different burning associations that have regional uh, presences in different parts of the state. And Todd Harmon, you can see at the bottom of uh, the image there, uh, is, a, is a contact for that group. But Google those two, is there some good uh, uh, information out there on the Kansas Prescribed Fire Councils and the Burning Associations of Kansas. And uh, there, uh, turn to them for resources and contractors and so forth that can help with the prescribed burn if it's something you don't feel like tackling yourself. Rotational grazings. I talked about uh, using cattle that have a little bit different uh, uh, grazing uh, methods than, than bison would. Uh, 
here on the uh, left side, you can see what maybe a typical or typical paddock might be where cattle are grazing. Uh, they do graze differently than bison, whereas base, bison are intensive altogether in herds uh, where they'll just eat everything and then move on and let that area rest. Cattle are more selective in the, the forage that they like to choose and will selectively pick certain species, not necessarily uh, mowing it down and moving on, uh, but kind of creating more of a monotypic uh, uh, structure uh, on a landscape where they graze. And they will oftentimes uh, can tend to uh, concentrate near water sources, as you see uh, in this bottom left here. And so the distribution of manure can be really uh, skewed towards uh, one location in that kind of grazing, which is typical of, of kind of cattle grazing in Kansas. With a shift towards more rotational grazing, you can think about, you can see about if you, in this middle uh, section, if you'd say break your uh, paddock into four uh, parts with permanent fencing, then you can move those cattle and, and have them more intensively graze. If you leave them on there longer for like a week, they will graze more everything down when there's not the forage to, to move on and selectively pick wherever they wanna go. Uh, it starts to simulate more what a bison uh, herd might do on the landscape, uh, which tends to, to lead towards more heterogeneous uh, kind of habitat on the landscape, uh, which is um, good for wildlife. And also it's good for eating down more of the trees and shrubs that would exist on the landscape that they don't necessarily do uh, in this, uh, this left example. You get a little better distribution of the manure in this case, where the water features are in the middle. Um, but you can really distribute that in, in an intensive rotational grazing uh, experience, where if you have the permanent fences of four quadrats, but then you have electric fences where you can really pinpoint and focus the grazing uh, for intensive times uh, in those each of those quarters, and then even give longer rest periods for some of the, the areas that aren't being used. Um, and the manure distribution is really well spread out then. Oklahoma State uh, University is a, is a great uh, uh, resource for rotational grazing and has done some really great work in this area. Um, and you can see here uh, an example of like, you can also do it without paddocks and fencing uh, by just burning certain sections of an open uh, range. And then the cattle will be attracted to the new green growth on the area that just burned. And then they will give the areas uh, rest like you see in the background. Uh, they'll allow some of that fuel to build up in those locations. And then once they've really grazed down all the areas in here, including some maybe the trees and shrubs that would have uh, persisted in these areas, then the, the new uh, kind of higher growth in the background will become uh, a new feature for a prescribed burn in the following year. And then the cattle will rotate uh, to be attracted to that area. And so if you mix up your, your burning regime on a landscape, you'll naturally move the cattle around in ways that would more simulate uh, what you would have seen in, in bison grazing situations. And so, as I stated a little earlier, it, it leads to a more heterogeneous uh, kind of uh, texture on the landscape, which is good for having more diversity, habitat for insects and birds and, and, and other wildlife. And, uh, and again, it does a better job of that intensive grazing in certain locations of keeping the trees and shrubs down as well. So uh, just a, another model to follow. And, and you can see that with grassland birds uh, that rely on different types of habitat, and in this you can see like killdeer, larkspur, sandpipers really like a, 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 a diminished habitat structure, whereas like Henslow sparrows on the other end of the spectrum will really like uh, dense cover. And uh, so if giving more of a mix of those types of, of, of cover on the landscape means more diversity of grassland birds. So a, another good side effect of, of rotational grazing. And you're also getting some income off the land. Another income producing element uh, that is good for uh, being stewards of prairie is uh, haying. And uh, using that hay to, to help feed livestock and also being able to effectively rid sites of, of trees and shrubs. And haying has also uh, been proven to be one of probably the most excellent ways of managing prairies for conserving biological diversity. And with that, you are just cutting it once, maybe twice at the most and uniformly. 
And so the existing diversity of, of grasses and wildflower species in that prairie uh, helps stay in that condition uh, as best as possible. And so for some of the, the most diverse and valued remnant prairies in Kansas, they've shown that uh, hay meadow guides uh, like this one produced by Kinsher and Bazinski, again, if you Google Native Prairie Hay Meadows, a landowner's management guide, you'll find this wonderful uh, detailed guide on a PDF that's free to review. Uh, check that out and you'll see why Hay Meadows is another excellent tool for, for maintaining prairie and keeping them free of trees and shrubs. Now, if more trees and shrubs start to invade into a prairie and it takes a more intensive approach and some bigger materials and, or bigger machinery, and you start to get into kind of bigger mowers and rotary brush mowers uh, that maybe hay machines uh, can't, can't take on. With hay machines, you're, you're dealing with uh, kind of a not ability to take on larger caliper uh, trees and shrubs. And so then you get into, you know, stronger, higher horsepower rotary brush mowers that can, that can, can be that, that uh, solution. Uh, for, for a really kind of a small swath of, of cut, you can get into the, the more uh, reasonably priced uh, walk behind brush mowers. Uh, this is one that I've, I've been very familiar with utilizing. Uh, it can be hard work, uh, but it is a lower cost option uh, for being able to create fire breaks and, and kind of keep some areas mowed down um, uh, as you're, you're trying to manage the early stages of invasion of trees and shrubs. So that's, that's one good uh, tool there. But if you're wanting to, uh, you know, kind of use higher horsepower and you can get into having tractors uh, to run those mowers, then uh, you can get into some of these more like uh, five foot to 10 foot and even 12 foot uh, wide uh, swaths of, of mowers that can have a bigger bite and be more efficient at, at covering um, bigger ground and being able to cut bigger trees too, like diameters of up to, to three and seven inches uh, with the, these bigger mowers. So those are, uh, as you get into to, to more invasion, you can get into some of these, these bigger, higher horsepower tools. Okay, now let's say that uh, the woody invasion is, is getting uh, even beyond what we're talking about as small little saplings and so forth, and we need to start cutting trees. Then we get into, you know, kind of more intensive methods uh, that range from, you know, kind of the, the small scale from using chainsaws and, and handheld cutting machines to uh, kind of the really bigger guns of, uh, of this spectrum of tree cutting, uh, which include uh, skid steer mounted uh, uh, cutters as well. And I'll say more about each of these here too. Uh, I've had in just re last couple of years, uh, a lot of fun helping uh, some friends and, and landowners that are trying to, to maintain this problem of tree invasion on prairies. They're uh, stewards of, of many acres. And, and not only do they see, you know, chainsaws as an effective tool of slowly kind of eating into the trees that have invaded on the prairie, but they see it as fun. It's a, it's a, it's a fun ritual of stewardship in addition to the prescribed burning uh, they're doing on the landscape. But when those burns don't kill certain trees, then they go after them during the, the fall, uh, winter, and spring months with, uh, with these kind of tools of chainsaws and pole saws. And, uh, you know, not only is it kind of a fun ritual to get out there and do that, uh, but it's good exercise and it helps create firewood, which uh, these folks end up uh, utilizing as, as part of their heat sources as well. So uh, it's, it's something that I've enjoyed doing and it's certainly an effective method uh, if you take the, the longer approach of, of being able to take years to be able to kind of uh, eat away at that, that woody invasion of the prairies. But if you really want to get after it and, and do so on a much bigger and, and faster scale, uh, you can do so with a lot more investment of money. And then you get into, uh, you know, these, these big powerful machines of uh, what we call skid steers. Uh, you know, skid steers can have uh, wheels, uh, but then they also have these version with tracks that are called CTL or compact track loader skid steers that really can go in about any terrain, you know, uh, dealing with uh, kind of rolling terrain, terrain that's wet and dry and um, can be these, these, these motors or these machinery, these pieces of machinery that can, can have all different sorts of attachment to them. They're really impressive. Uh, you know, new, you can see you're getting into a, a much higher range of investment, 60 to 120,000, generally what I saw. <clears throat> 
you can also get into cheaper uh, machinery uh, used ones uh, at, at lower uh, scales from 10 to 60, but it really varies. Lots of different sites out there to explore. You can kind of get lost in the options that are out there. But once you do have some one of these skid steer, these CTL skid steer machines, uh, there are all kinds of attachments, and we'll just go through a, a few of those options. The, the, the tree saws are definitely an effective tool uh, for some of the, the, the smaller trees, up to about 10 inches in diameter. And you see a couple of models here, uh, but varying prices up to about $10,000 uh, that do provide a, a, a pretty quick cutting tool for cutting down trees out there. And you get the lopper options as well that uh, have you know hydraulics that will um, take and grab a tree and, and lop them. You can get into a little bit larger sizes of diameters of trees here as well, or like uh, 12 to 16 inches in diameter and uh, many different options out there as well. Uh, what you have with these options though, is that you have trees that are still standing out there. So you have to deal with the, uh, the debris, you have to either pile them up or you have to let them slowly deteriorate over, over years and even decades. Um, and you know, fire will hasten that process, but it, it doesn't rid, while, while it does cut down the shading vegetation and helps the, the grasses and wildflowers that are there in the, in the soil rebound uh, because you're cutting, you're increasing the sunlight uh, on those areas, even when you have dead uh, trees out there, you're still not getting rid of the debris. And, and a lot of people like to do that. So then what you can get into, and this is still with keeping the debris on the landscape, but if you're really wanting, uh, to uh, open up the sunlight and do so quickly because you're losing uh, of trees or you're losing grassland and what and wildflowers to to shade of trees. Another technique you can get into is to to quickly kill those trees but still leave the the biomass there on site. You know, not even cut the trees down. And for, for really low cost options, if you don't mind using some uh, judicious use of chemicals, you have the, the hack and squirt method, which is basically with a little hatchet shop, uh, you create uh, kind of an incision through the cambium layer. And while that hatchet's in there, you kind of bend it, put a few drops of herbicide, uh, and, and a couple of different recipes uh, provided here, 20% uh, arsenal and 80% water. Um, and, the other being imazapir, glyphosate, or triclopyr uh, for the, the recipes that are, that are given in their specifications. It just takes a few drops and you can actually kill a tree. And, uh, and that can also be an effective method for, for starting that process of knocking back uh, the, 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 the bad effects of shade of trees and shrubs out there. Check out these YouTubes for, for how showing how easy it is uh, out there, or just Google the hack and squirt method and you'll quickly come up with uh, these videos. Another method, if you do wanna do the cutting, keeping in mind that, that any of the cutting techniques, if you get down below the lowest branch with a cedar, you will kill it and not have it re-sprout. But if you do deciduous trees, which, is those, which are those trees that have their leaves that fall in the winter, uh, you're going to get trees that, that are going to re-sprout. And that would include all the native trees that we have in Kansas, like, you know, cottonwoods and oaks and elms and hackberries and willows and all these different kind of native trees that would have historically been just in the in the kind of the stream corridors where fires, uh, you know, were, were kind of snuffed out and, and not killing those trees. These trees that have now gotten up on the landscape are, are even when they get cut, will will resprout and and you will not be rid of them. So, uh, it is important to follow up the cutting of those trees with uh, a, a painting of the cambium layer, the outer edge of that uh, that tree ring, uh, to to effectively kill it. I'm a big fan. If I, if I have to use herbicides, of using like a concentrated glyphosate. Uh, glyphosate is the active ingredient Roundup, uh, the trade name uh, that lost their patent. And so, you know, Roundup is still used out there, but many other companies are using that active ingredient in glyphosate, using a concentrated method in what is kind of considered one of the maybe more benign uh, uh, chemicals or herbicides that are out there is, is would be my preference of that water-based herbicide to use. Some people like to use a, a more toxic uh, oil-based herbicide like Tordon. 
Uh, not necessarily a fan of that one because it is more persistent. It can spread, stay in the soil, it can kill other plants around the tree and is uh, kind of a little bit more toxic in the landscape. And it can also migrate around as well while water was spreading it, whereas glyphosate will break down more quickly. I doesn't say glyphosate is completely, you know, um, um, safe to use uh, from exposure standpoint to our skin, you should still uh, keep in mind of the possible, um, you know, uh, risks of, of exposure to uh, chemicals. Uh, but uh, I, I think it is probably a little bit on the safer end of the spectrum. So uh, I'm an advocate more for using um, um, glyphosate uh, in this cut and treat method. If you really want to get into then uh, uh, higher uses of, of herbicides, you can, um, like say for blackberries, a real problem in the sand hills or like Western Harvey County, close to where we are, uh, then sometimes a foliar spray is what uh, land managers will, managers will use out there in addition to say mowing and, and burning. Um, so just kind of one more toolbox if it's one that you're willing to use. However, this uh, not only is it more of a broadcast use of chemicals, uh, but it also does take uh, kind of bigger and more expensive machinery to dispense that chemical out on the landscape. Here's just an example of uh, probably uh, you know one of the one of the more effective and and higher cost uh, options out there. Uh, this big Massey Ferguson rig, uh, I think, it produced by even by our local uh, industry Agco here in Heston, uh, can be one of those effective tools for efficiently getting um, that herbicide where you need it and treating big. Uh, big invasions of, of blackberries that can be, you know, kind of 10, even 15 foot tall, ba uh, big um, kind of areas of, of canes that just dominate and, and snuff out uh, prairie vegetation in those areas. And it's just sort of one of those early stages that you get of invasion of woody plants as trees uh, will quickly follow in. But uh, just one more option in your tool chest of, of uh, trying to tackle woody plants out there. Now we get into the probably the most expensive realm and, and the biggest guns when it comes to clearing big trees out there. And it gets into these uh, kind of skid steer mulchers. I'll just cover three options that I've seen out there that seem to be really effective tools. Uh, the first one being the single disc cutter and mulcher. Uh, to see one of these things come in and take out a tree that can be up to about 14 inches in diameter and not only cut it down, but then suck it in on the side of that disc and, and grind it up and throw that mulch everywhere is really something to see. It can do so just in a matter of seconds even. Uh, you know, we're talking about high power equipment, high velocity turning discs. It takes a uh, big horsepower uh, skid steers to run these things. And uh, and you can see the specifications there in the slide. I won't show the, the YouTube yet. I'm gonna actually provide in the comments section these uh, YouTube links uh, for you to check out some of these uh, very impressive uh, tools in action. Uh, out there. But that's the, the single disc cutter mulcher option. You get the twin disc and anvil mulcher where you get uh, those two rotating discs that come into each other towards the middle and it basically draws those trees into the middle and it will, it can, you can take on up to about a 14 inch diameter tree and just splinter it and throw out the, the, the chips uh, in, in all directions. Uh, it's a really impressive array of how it can take a big tree and just cut it and grind it up and, and turn it into uh, basically piles of, of mulch uh, right there on site. But as you can see with the last one, you know, twenty-five thousand dollars for that diamond brand uh, single disc cutter. Uh, you get, uh, you know, almost forty thousand for this twin disc uh, version from Promac, the Promac TDM. Uh, impressive, but you, you're getting into some some big dollars too uh, when it comes to trying to tackle these sites. But it's amazing how much faster and more efficiently you can get into uh, reversing that invasion of trees and shrubs on the landscape. And then a third option, and this is one that really uh, kind of is a safer for P if you have people around in the area, uh, maybe more in park settings or whatever, that it really encases that that production of mulch as it takes down a big tree. And again, up to like 14 inch diameter tree, you come right up to it, uh, you start to grind away at the side of it. And as it knocks it over, you can pull it over and then you drive over it and, and it just mulches that tree up right there on the site under the, the hood of that, uh, the grinding mechanisms. And um, 
all for just the, the price of a skid steer and about $40,000 in that drum mulcher. Uh, but wow, they are really uh, if, uh, impressive to see how a lot of horsepower in this kind of machinery can, can really uh, take back uh, prairie areas really quickly that have been lost to big trees. I sort of geeked out over a number of days on sort of researching uh, different types of, of options that are out there. Uh, see me if you'd like you know, me to send you the spreadsheet of, of some of the specifications and YouTube links and that some of the options that are out there. If you want to get into any of these attachments on, on big skid steers or, or um, the like. So that's in a, in a nutshell, some of the options of kind of the new disturbance regimes. Uh, that we're looking at there with, with haying and mowing, uh, cutting trees, spraying and grinding trees. And uh, then um, I want to finish with just turning you on to some other uh, resources that are out there. This can be a really daunting uh, problem and, and one that is coming at us very quickly. And so thankfully, uh, the USDA and the Natural Resources Conservation Service, the NRCS, have kind of teamed up to create this Great Plains Grassland Initiative, the GPGI. Check it out, GPGI, Great Plains Grassland Initiative on the web, uh, find it and you'll find lots of resources out there for land managers as they're trying to tackle this big problem. And you can kind of see where you're at in, in the process, whether you're just in the early invasion stage or if you're deep into the encroachment of woody plants, they kind of help you do assessments, figure out where you are in that, and knowing then kind of what resources you need to implement to try to tackle your problem. And uh, there are some really knowledgeable people, some great uh, YouTube videos out there, uh, lots of links that you can turn to uh, to help check it out, including things like, say, this flow chart. Where are you in this flow chart? And then what kind of resources might you want to turn to uh, with that? These are just some, some screen grabs or screenshots of some of what you might find on that uh, site. But this, this GPGI was just introduced to me recently. Uh, I can't believe I haven't known about it sooner, but uh, uh, the folks at the Nature Conservancy uh, turned me on to this. And I, it looks like a really one, a good one that people should stay in touch with. Here's a, a contact screen uh, to, to check out um, further what some of the, the resources might be and how you can get a hold of them. One of the things that I like that they, they identified in some of their, their videos uh, was, again, the importance of and the, and the dire straits of, of this issue today, the invasion of woody trees and shrubs on our landscape and how quickly we are losing grasslands and how important it is to tackle the problem as early as possible to save resources of time and, and money and, and all that effort. So just look at this image right here, a pretty much open prairie. You kind of go by that and think, oh, there's no need for any work to be done here. Well, look at that one tree out there in that draw. And you get closer, you see that that tree is an Osage orange. And it's an Osage orange uh, that is full of fruits. Um, and it just uses some of the, like on this branch, you can see there are 30 fruits at 250 seeds per fruit, amounting to almost 8,000 seeds uh, that are coming right in that small uh, little seed source. And so that can quickly get out of hand as those seeds start to disperse. They create new little saplings. And within just a, a handful of years or, or even decades, the problem has exploded. And it, it happens even faster with cedars. So you look at that, that one cedar there or a couple of there along the fence line. Uh, each one of those cedars, they estimate, can have, you know, a million and a half uh, seeds produced annually if that's a female tree. And, you know, the birds love to, to eat those seeds and spread them. And, and again, that, that problem can, can, can really get out of hand quickly as those uh, seedlings spread across the landscape. And I show this slide again just to show how fast it's happening here. You know, in a matter of decade, you're seeing this exponential growth and this loss of grassland this problem needs to be dealt with now, folks, and it needs to be hit really hard. If we're going to conserve this legacy that we have in Kansas, this grassland prairie uh, legacy that is important as our, our cultural and natural history in Kansas and, and also supporting our economy. So thank you for letting me take a deep, deep dive into this uh, topic. And uh, I look forward to some more conversation. Let's hear your questions and, and comments. And play.